What's up guys, I'm Dave McConey, and if you're watching this, you are obviously on the 3DMJ channel for part two of the podcast with Dr. Scott Stevenson and Dr. Eric Helms. Click the link down below to check out part one on my channel, Brains and Gains. And for every one of these podcasts I do, I make a personal donation to the charity of choice of the guest. And so since we have two guests today, we're gonna have two different charities that I'm supporting, and we're gonna have the links down below, so if you like the causes, you can make a personal donation yourself. So I really hope you guys enjoy the podcast. Yeah, I have, I have some cool thoughts on this one because yeah, um, I would have answered this differently in uh, early 2017. I would have been like, yeah, wow. that's all good and nice, but every single time uh, we see a study on, on range of motion, um, larger range of motion beats it out. And it would be the same rationale for why you'd actually want to do stretching because we see that stretching is itself attention stimulus and going through full range of motion, you get a uh, that effect. Um, Performance is a whole other can of worms uh, because basically we know that full range of motion transfers to all the range of motions underneath it. So like if you do full squats, you get better at half squats. And uh, for the most part, that, that that's an accurate statement. Uh, there are probably some times you could use partials. But for the specific purpose of bodybuilding, I really liked what Scott specifically said about the exercise probably makes a big difference here. So we've seen squats, uh, preacher curls, and some other leg, and a study on a number of different leg movements where full range of motion beat out partials. And these are the, the, the way to do this that's ecologically valid is when you let the person train close to failure or at a relative load that they can use that's maximal through that range of motion. The way to do it that's not valid is you have them do the same load. And then, you know, like we can all quarter squat way more than we can full squat. And if you like, you're doing full squats with, say, 315, then you're doing quarters with 315. Of course, full range of motion is going to be better than the other one. The other one's just too piss easy, right? Right. Um, but yeah, like for example, in that preacher curl study, I think by Ronnie, R-O-N-E-I, uh, they just had them do the, the most load they could do here or the most load they could do here through each one of those. And the, uh, the full range of motion group smoked the, uh, the partial. But there was a study that came out, getting back to my main point, I think it was a Japanese study in 2017, and I had to find it where they looked at um, barbell tricep extensions. And they found that the, the partial range of motion group actually far outperformed in terms of hypertrophy, the full range of motion group. And here's the important thing about the exercise difference here. If they had done a cable tricep pushdown, I bet you it would have been the opposite results because it keeps a constant tension on the muscle while you're going through elbow extension. But when you're doing a barbell tricep extension, there's points of range of motion in that, uh, that range where you're unloaded, especially at like the top, for example, or at the, uh, basically it speaks to Scott's point is that there are, if you can take an exercise and look at it and go, you know, the, the, this, this movement at that point is not loading my target musculature, then if you did a partial range of motion and you went to failure, you would be accruing more time under tension at a higher magnitude of tension for the specific muscle group. So I think in specific circumstances, and you kind of have to logic your way through each exercise and using certain modalities, and sometimes it'll be free weights because you can keep constant tension curves on like a machine or, or a cable, I could see a rationale. And there's actually empirical support for that. So just for anyone who's nerding out and is curious, I think the main author was uh, Goto. Uh, and oh, it yes. was in the JSCR, partial range of motion exercise is effective for facilitating muscle hypertrophy and function via sustained intermuscular hypoxia in young trained men. And they were looking specifically at triceps. So um, I think it's probably a little too black and white just to say full range of motion better than partial. I think that's genuinely true if we have the a priori assumption that we're talking about a range, range of motion that is always stimulating the target muscle, then yeah. Full, full range of motion is going to beat out partial for all the reasons that we said maybe there's a rationale for stretching. But I think in cases where um, the exercise won't always be targeting a specific muscle group or those times where it's that range of motion is not effective for what you're trying to accomplish, then it might not be the case. And we have data to support that. So I think um, that that's also an interesting application of, of some... Some, some 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 concepts that have only been, just been been kind of scratched out in the literature. Your speculation there that it would be opposite if it was like a cable kickback is interesting to me because it sounds like you're then saying the reason is that the constant tension is there. And I thought 
more so in recent years, it had been discussed that maybe constant tension isn't that important. And uh, am I wrong in that? So there's a difference between just tension and um, and constant tension. Like, oh, I can't you can't let it slip up. I'm more talking about like the area under the curve. Like right. if you took a set to failure of, uh, of, 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 a, of a movement, a singular set, and you looked at it in isolation, and you looked at the actually the impulse. So that's the force curve over time and the area under that curve. You would see more uh, if you were keeping tension on a given muscle group uh, versus gotcha. if you had drops out of it, but you were moving. Um, I don't know if I did a great job of explaining that with impulse. I thought it would be better, but the <laughs> it's not that... It's the, okay. I'll, here, I'll frame it this way. It's not that you're losing tension on the muscle. It's that you're spending time in a fixed period for a set where you're not training that muscle at certain points versus you are. Right. So um, that's why, I th like, like if you did uh, over time a whole bunch of compound movements that did uh, have drop offs and 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 high points of hitting these muscle groups, you're still going to build a lot of muscle. Uh, and it's not like you issue an entire system of training like like powerlifting. Oh, it doesn't build muscle. You got to do it all, all cables. Well, we've seen some pretty big powerlifters. You know, like that that definitely works. Um, it's more a question of in isolation. If we're going to take one movement and look at its effect over time and manipulate the range of motion, just in that case, that's when you might see a difference. But I don't necessarily think that means you need to change your performance of every single exercise, or think. That the magnitude of tension doesn't matter, just the, the constancy of it or the time under tension. Uh, because, you know, like we're always, like we're all posturally supporting our body right now. We're in a gravity well, we're on Earth. It takes some force output for us to sit here and we're not just constantly getting bigger all the time. And if you leave the gravity well, astronauts get small really quick. I know it sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but Let's move so to Jupiter. You, we'll make that happen. Oh, man, we'd be so jacked. <laughs> we'd be jacked. If we lived. <laughs> We wouldn't, but it would be the most jacked. It would be very body. flat and very, yes. I think we'd look very different. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably too much resistance. We would need to, like, maybe, like, we would need to travel to different planets in the solar system to get up to Jupiter. So, find optimal. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, yeah, another thought on, on that is it's actually it's a very complex idea. Is you can imagine, a, like, some sort of a pure, let's say, a trice of extension exercise. You could construct those. If you track activation across the range of motion, you would see greater activation at one end versus the middle versus at another end, depending on, uh, on the movement, whether it's a free weight or a cable, even the angle at which the cable is extending away from the body relative to the upper arm. And so the idea with the pump sets and doing those, those, those partial movements throughout the set is when you pick up whatever exercise it is, you find that point of the range of motion where you can just sense that the activation is best. And, and if you have a compound movement, like a question, I don't know how many millions of times I've probably seen this, is, you know, should you, for, for hypertrophy for the chest, should you lock out on your presses? Because you see all these guys with great chests who never do lockouts. The lockout in larger part, large part is a function of the triceps. So they will just do partials at the lower end of the range of motion because it's more pec dominant and they don't want to basically fatigue the triceps by finishing that end of the range of motion so the triceps become the limitation for performance and taking the set to failure with the pecs as quote unquote the weak link causing momentary muscular failure and thus not no longer being really the uh, uh, the main muscle that's being targeted for that compound exercise so that's kind of the idea you could do if you're going to if you did do and normally I wouldn't suggest people do this because it's more complex but if you did have a chest exercise where you felt like this is all triceps at the end and someone was doing a pump set I would not have any problem with them just doing partials where they feel the pecs best maybe going here once and then doing mainly partials at that end range but that part of the range of motion where they get, feel the pecs best just makes sense you're not really looking at and, and it's worth noting too you're not really looking at the logbook although some people want to they get really logbook attached but you're not really watching the logbook on the pump sets. Those are just kind of fun. It's the bodybuilder mindset. It's like, I'm going to go in here, have a good time, try to sort of destroy and pump up the muscle. The other days, I'm going to worry about my progressive overload because we know that works. This is a time to create a blood flow occlusion effect, target the muscle, maybe get better with a mind-muscle connection, and just have fun picking the exercises that I don't, 
sort of the, maybe even the fluffy exercises that I wouldn't otherwise be doing. So, yeah, but it's a complex biomechanical and electrophysiological um, phenomenon there where you're hitting the muscle best in the range of motion. I think that's a really important point you made that um, when we're talking about these neat, cool, kind of side effect, tricky, fun, out there things, we are assuming that you have a baseline structure of progressive overload and a sound setup program. Right. And I think that is that is really, really critical because I will tell you right now, like my overall philosophy is, yeah, bodybuilders use exercises to train muscle groups but they do way more than bodybuilders realize. Like when you do a lat pull down, you're actually hitting your tricep a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. okay. like shoulder yeah, extensions sure. assisted by the tricep. Like when you do a curl, you're actually hitting your anterior delt a little bit or like, like your bicep assists and shoulder flexion. There's, there's things that are, are much more integrated and complex than, than most of us realize. And I think it is uh, almost fundamentally impossible to have like a pec day. Like you, right. you can call it that, but right. that's not a pec day, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I think that bodybuilders kind of focus on tradition a lot uh, and train based on what's been what's come previously because there's so little research on it. So they, they more they more so follow what the top trainers and top pros are doing. And you see a lot of holdovers and belief systems and perspectives that aren't necessarily um, maybe the best way to do things like experimenting with training full body never really seems to take off among bodybuilders. Um, why is that? Is, is it because it doesn't work? Or is it just because you have to think about controlling your volume, your frequency, and your intensity per session? And bodybuilders really like to either do a lot of volume or a lot of intensity or both in the same session, you know? So in general, when I prescribe compound movements, I tell the bodybuilders to focus on doing the movement properly, you know? It's rare to see uh, powerlifters with, with, with shitty pecs and triceps, you know. Yeah. It happens, but it, it's, it's not the norm. Uh, same thing with glutes and quads when it comes to squats and deadlifts and hamstrings, right? Um, so I like to build a base of focusing on the core lifts and, and using those movements as movements. And then once you've got that, you can kind of fill in those gaps with some of the fluffy work, the metabolic stuff, stretching all kinds of other exercises, et cetera. So I, I just think that that's an important point, even when we do kind of discuss some of these other cool possibilities. Yeah. yeah, Scott, I almost view your training as like the scientific way to do bro training. You know, like you have the, you know, like the pump <laughs> stuff you. in there. I'll and take the it partials. as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, it is because, you know, it's like, like I said, all those like intensity techniques, the things that like the quote unquote bros want to do to like feel sure. intense. But you have, I mean, I forget how many studies that you quoted in your book, I, hundreds. Um, but, you know, you obviously have a very scientific approach to it. And I think also that allows people like myself who kind of need evidence to really follow something. It allows me to kind of go into that approach believing in it more so than just thinking like, okay, I'm just doing a bro lift because this guy's huge kind of thing. Yeah, there, oh man, there's so much there. Um, yeah, there's... Uh, there has to be some appeal. You have to look at this from a behavioral standpoint, too. As Eric mentioned, people don't like to do full body splits. Um, if you look around, there's a, basically a logical fallacy that applies here that in order to look like the biggest and best bodybuilders, you need to train just like the biggest and best bodybuilders do. But people don't realize that those would be the, probably the biggest and best bodybuilders, almost no matter how they train, because most of them are extreme responders that are using mass amount of drugs or, or both. Um, but it needs to be fun as well. You could mm -hmm. construct a program, um, you know, that could be logically sound, that was perf that was completely progressive overload based in every every way, shape, or form. But we're not automatons. Some bodybuilders can be very OCD and would adhere to that. They would do whatever you told them. But it should also be fun. I mean, I'm the, this whole thing should be somewhat somewhat enjoyable for most people. It's a hobby. So, you know, having the different set types makes logical sense, of course, because we know that you can progress with each of those. There's science to substantiate each idea. The different stimuli from muscle growth come together. But it's also fun to have variety. Variety is also important, too. So you can, you can substantiate that, but it also makes for fun training. It's, it's a funny thing. I, I get people who read the book sometimes, and they get lost in this sea of details. And I can't figure out how to do this. And literally, I can explain fortitude training in like 60 seconds. It's not really that difficult to execute. 
You just kind of read the overview sheets. As long as you know how to do the set types, you can do it. And you can look at it for someone like you who's very logical and scientifically oriented. It satisfies that behavioral. It's okay, I know there's a reason that he's doing each of these things. And I can back that up. And some people just like, okay, today's the day I get to go in and have fun. I'm going to do some pump set type of thing. I'm going to just make it up. And that floats their boat. So either way, the boats are getting floated, and it makes people train hard. And if boats you train hard, you're going to progress. Float. Yeah, the boats must float <laughs> for gains to happen. Quote of the, of the podcast. <laughs> so that if you're if you're happy and having fun with the training, you're going to train harder. You're going to progress better. And that's that's yeah. pretty simple. Yeah. So I, that's I really like that, man. I think yeah. um, I'm going to I'm going to wax cultural a, a little bit here, Ben and uh, Dave. Feel free to cut me off as always, but the um, enjoyment is is so important like one thing that i can also say about the top trainers and the top bodybuilders is that to a man or to a woman they love bodybuilding um and 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 the ones who don't don't stick around and uh they find a way to really really enjoy their training whether they're very ocd and driven by the logbook and they enjoy progress and they enjoy being able to quantify that progress or they enjoy the experience or some combination thereof which is me and, and a lot of people I work with, I think that needs to be respected. And not, not even just like, all right, I'll give you a little, I'll give you as much as I need to of what you want, but I'm going to give you what you need. Like that attitude, I think is, it's like, oh, this is this annoying, dumb thing where I have to treat you like a human and enjoy his training. Like, no, I actually think that's a pathway to really good progress is facilitating that enjoyment. Um, and if you look back to the, uh, like the 30s and 40s, uh, where there were the Bob Hoffman era, era started to become the war with Weeder and their split. Um, bodybuilders did not need to be training one RM clean and presses, and 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 they knew that, and like the Weeder camp knew that, and they were fighting against that. But people, because bodybuilding grew out of physical culture, and that grew into weightlifting in the Iron Game, and you know senior national weightlifting championships was held on the same weekend as bodybuilding shows like the mr america competition yeah. they were so intermingled that people loved lifting heavy back then and everybody trained full body three to six days per week all the way through like the 1950s and then you saw some upper lower splits but people wouldn't let go of the idea of only training like a weightlifter who also did some supplementary exercises because it was cool it's what the cool kids did it was fun and they wanted to see who had the biggest overhead press. That was the bench press of the day, you know. Um, and it was really difficult to get, get, get people to think differently or, or let go of it. Uh, and then I think the same thing happened. You had the Nautilus influence and then kind of the rise of, of anabolics and bodybuilding and machines. And then the, uh, the body part splits took over. And now we're kind of seeing the same thing. Um, you know, one of the most advanced evidence-based purely scientific programs that, that came out Based on what was out at the time, was you guys familiar with HST? Mm -hmm. Sure, I have like Brian. specific yeah, training he's coming on tomorrow. Oh, I yeah. Like that. So yeah. you know the crazy thing? I think that came out late '90s, early 2000s. Brian Haycock's HST. Um, that lines up with the meta analyses that have been published in the last three years. I, it was literally 15 years ahead of its time. I think there's a few things like strategic de deconditioning that I don't necessarily think are are currently supported. I uh, definitely need deloads, but I don't think it's going to make you grow more per se. Mm -hmm. But everything else, like, hey, you know, the, the volume you need per session doesn't need to be that high. Uh, all the data we have shows that moderating your volume and doing it more frequently might get a greater net effect. D it didn't take off. HST didn't take off. The, and and the, 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 uh, there was a recent survey of bodybuilders, I think in 2013. So now we're looking at like 15 years past when I became aware of H HST. Um, two thirds of the bodybuilders were training with a one one day per week split, one third of the two day per week split. So we're looking at basically your standard chest, back, legs, shoulders, arms. Take the weekend off, or your chest and back, legs, shoulders, arm, uh, rinse and repeat. Take Sunday off, kind of approach. It's, it's pretty much everybody, uh, for mm -hmm. the most part. And I think it's perhaps a little bit different in different areas. Like I know some of the in the natural ranks, you'll see a lot more upper lowers, but that's still a split if you think about it. Um, and unless you're training up or lower six days a week, you're not getting over that two times per week frequency. But anyway, my, my point is, is that, um, what is considered fun, what is considered cool, what, what is, uh, seen to, to be, to be done, 
um, is something that is very societally driven and personally driven. Like my whole contest prep, I've been training full body five days a week and not with a crazy volume, just like, you know, three to six sets per muscle group. Because I find it's the best way for my energy levels and to, to go through contest prep. Like when I'm on eight kcals per pound on a low day, the idea of having to do three sets of squats, RDL, leg press, leg extension, and leg curl sounds like something that's probably just not going to happen and without me ah. limping out of the gym or being rolled out, um, yeah. you know. So, but me going right, I got three sets of squats today. I can get my three sets of RDLs tom uh, tomorrow. And then two days after that, I got leg press. That I can do, you know. Um, so I've, I think people need to really kind of explore internally like, hey, what, what do I get excited about? Uh, what gets me going? What floats my boat, if we yes. will? Um, and then go, right, how can I take that and apply it to what we know is in the realm of optimal? Because we kind of treat optimal like it's this very narrow parameters. But in reality, when we look at what we know about muscle growth, we got a lot of room to play with. we got a whole playground um, that, that can work. And somewhere in there, you can find that perfect blend between what you really enjoy, your personality type, how are you more analytical or more experiential? And then what works for your 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 lifestyle and then and then go for it. Like for example, I've actually been thinking a lot about playing with blood flow restriction and playing with stretching based on some of the research that's come out. But what I would do, just because the way my brain thinks and what I what I would want, and I'm a scientist, I like to control one variable at a time, is I would repeat basically the same baseline block of training. So I'd have like, you know, a couple of cycles and then I have like, and here's my add on. So this month I'm going to do stretching after my training. Next month I'm going to do BFR on all my single, single joint movements. The month after that, I'm going to do heavy loaded eccentrics with the spotter, you know, and then I'll recycle that and then take a deload. And that won't, that be cool. Like I get excited about it mm -hmm. and it's, that's experimental. We don't have good data on, on any three of those as being additive on top of a regular program, but that allows me to A, have fun, B, try new shit, B, masochistic, which is part and parcel of being a bodybuilder, yeah. do things that hurt, right? right. And then <laughs> see if, any, if that, that actually produced some kind of uh, unique progress for me. So I think, uh, I think being evidence-based shouldn't be meaning that you're overly conservative. It shouldn't be that you're not willing to experiment. And it shouldn't be that you were rigid and think there's only one way to do it. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, I think just talking to people like just two days ago, I did a consultation with somebody and almost half of the time it was just talking about how to incorporate this into your life so that you think you can do long term and keeping it fun. Because the, the longer I've been doing this, the more that just seems like the main point is, you know, the consistency over optimality is so important for this endeavor. Um, thankfully, I'm pretty stubborn. So even though I was doing it maybe in like not a super healthy way mentally in high school. I just kept pushing and kept pushing. Um, and thankfully I did learn to make it more fun and incorporate it. But I, I've spent years and I think I've talked with both of you guys about this before, but I spent years just missing out on social opportunities, um, doing routines that I didn't necessarily like, uh, just it really like took over my life in an unhealthy way. And that's probably the main thing I see drive people away is just they don't find a way to make it like you said, Scott, make it fun or just even a way that they can be consistent with it because it's such a big change for them and it's such a thing that they don't really want to do that unless like they're completely obsessed with it, it just it drops off. Yeah, um, there's um, a, a one thought. Uh, John Meadows, actually, he does a, a little bit of what you mentioned there, Eric, and in, in, in the programs that he's written out is that he, he will pick blood flow restriction or he'll pick ISO holds, he calls them, or he'll pick some particular technique. He's done this with a lot of his programs, and he's still employing the same. He's got a sort of a four-stage way of, of moving through a muscle group in each exercise, and that's better for John to talk about. But then he'll, he adds one of those things to each of his programs. So just to sort of experiment in that way, it's not, it's not the exact same block of training with one thing added in, but it's the same kind of idea. And the inter there's so many interesting things here. Like we, we know where there are extreme responders and moderate responders and then people who are sort of non-responders. And I've kind of tracked this back um, and the research supports this to the, in the initial satellite cell density and growth factor release is greater in people who are extreme responders um, to resistance exercise, resistance training in terms of muscle growth. And 
when I wonder, I wonder if there's something going on in terms of, for instance, a threshold in terms of the initiating the whole satellite cell preferentiation, differentiation, incorporation into, new, into muscle cells to expand that myonuclear domain <coughs> that might require in people who are moderate or well, maybe we would categorize as non-responders, them to train a little more frequently um, than those who are extreme responders who typically do the bro splits. Mm. Um, there's one study, it's, it's, I think it's from 2007 now, and, um, but basically they, uh, they found that there's a, it's about a five-day window when you see satellite cell activity after, in this case, it was eccentric, an eccentric loading regime. And that matches well with training once a week. You basically train once, you've stimulated the whole growth process, and it perpetuates itself for about five or six days. And someone who has a good response to that and then you could train again. Whereas if you have a piss poor response, you may need to bump that that stimulus more often throughout the course of the week in order to perpetuate growth. So we don't even know basically we know very little about what sort of an intervention would be for someone who's a non responder. It's really kind of bizarre to me that there are people who would not respond to resistance exercise in terms of some form of hypertrophy. What are we doing wrong in those studies? What's wrong about that stimulus for those individuals? What are they lacking genetically? Are there single nucleotide polymorphisms that we can target? Um, and then, of course, there's the whole idea of placebo effects. Um, mm. the, you know, there have been a study, couple of studies now with power lifters, and one that was done at University of Massachusetts was one of my favorite studies of all time where they, Gideon Ariel did this. I think it was published in 1970. This is one of the ones they could never do nowadays with IRBs. They had a competition among all the strength and power athletes there and uh, told them that the ones who increased, I think it was overhead press and a squat maybe, um, and there's a third exercise too, I believe. Maybe it's just those two. Those who best performed over the first like eight weeks would then be entered in a study where they received Dianabol. You know this one, mm -hmm. yeah. So they I, took I love them this study. They, yeah, I love this study. They brought them in to the student health and explained to them all the uh, side effects they might experience, completely increased their expectancies of having like this phenomenal growth period. And then when they trained them for the next six weeks, they had like one and a half to two times the increase in strength when they were getting sugar pills. Purely a placebo effect. And... Um, there's an author by the name of Ted Kapchuk, who I know from the acupuncture literature. He wrote a book called The Web That Has No Weaver. He's an oriental medical physician. He's an acupuncturist. And he started doing Western research. There's a really nice review that came out in 2015. And at least at that time, they had isolated 28 genes, I believe, that are associated with amenability to a placebo effect. Mm. And 26 of those genes have gene products that are drug targets. So, wow. yeah, so there's the potential that they raise, which is a really phenomenal one, is, for instance, one of those is uh, catecholomethyltransferase, which breaks down catecholamines. Dopamine is important for what's going on in your brain in terms of pleasure and drive and those sorts of things. People that have low COMT activity, there's, I guess, basically two forms of that gene, tend to be those who have a greater amenability to placebo effect. So there's actually drugs that inhibit COMT. The idea they put forth there is that if you, for instance, wanted to give a drug to treat whatever it may be, and you could also co-administer drugs that impair or activate the gene products related to placebo effects, so you could couple a placebo effect with a drug effect and get a better overall effect. So imagine mm. supplements of the future that already set up these wonderful expectancies with these horrible bogus ads. It's going to be the greatest thing. You're going to look like pro IFEB Pro X, Y, and Z. And now instead of lacing things with pro hormones or designer steroids, they lace them with placebo effect. Like quercetin and vitamin E actually inhibit COMT for what it's worth. I don't know the doses. I'm trying to figure that out. I saw it noted, just a couple studies. But there will be drugs that probably can amplify a placebo effect down the road. So what happens if we take people like in the University of Massachusetts study and we find those non-responders and we just basically hit them with the placebo-enhancing drug? We figured out with any change in program design potentially how to get them to grow better because they think they will. We've actually altered the brain chemistry to do so. 
So there's so many things that are like unknowns as far to as far as how to like optimize program design for people who grow well versus the, for those who don't. And it's a, it is a pretty large window, really, and it depends on motivation ultimately um, mm. to, to a certain degree. Like how much do you really want to, and will you continue to do this? Consistency is is so important for this over the long haul, at least. That study always. I, I really would. I mean, I know they, they kind of can't do that now, but I really wish that they could replicate that study because it just yeah. seems so impossible to me. <laughs> uh, like just that because I think it was something like they went up 10 kilograms or yeah, in um, like across their lifts for like the pre-testing period. And then when they had the placebo, it was something like 40 plus kilograms across their lifts. Like two and three it's just, times greater. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just so. Half the time, and, four and, times the gains, I think. It was something yeah, stupid like and, that. and these were advanced lifters these weren't like noobs to training or anything so I, I just i have to see it i don't know it's, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that yeah. kind of progress it's also not the only uh fake steroid study too there's a, yeah. there's there's, there's one or two more yeah, where they uh they show the same thing you know the yeah, the expectancy effects are pretty big and man i'm actually for i think it'll come out in um in may in mass not in april uh but uh oh my god when is it going to come out yeah, I think it'll come out in May. I, I, I there was a, there was one of many studies on placebos in uh, Paralympic weightlifters where they gave them, um, not specifically that there's many studies on Paralympic weightlifters, but there's many studies on the placebo effect. This study was on Paralympic weightlifters, and they gave them uh, sugar pills and told them it was uh, six milligrams per kg of caffeine, and they saw higher velocities when they were doing uh, bench press throws with fifty percent of one RM. Um, Nothing crazy, but it was an effect. And uh, I use that as a foil to write about the placebo effect and how in supplement marketing, which is very in, in line with what you were saying. And, and there's, a, there's a few lines of research that look at uh, self-esteem and self-efficacy mediate Ooh. how uh, the placebo effect. Uh, because if you don't believe that you're good enough to get an effect from training or nutrition or you don't have the ability to adhere to a weight loss program, for example, it's much easier to put faith in something external, like a pill that you're taking. Um, and there was a kind of a, a sad study, if you think about it, back in 2014, <laughs> where they uh, they did weight loss counseling, and then they had three groups: one that got uh, no weight loss pill, uh, one that was told, "Hey, you, here's a pill, 50/50 chance you're in the placebo group or the weight loss group," and the other uh, group that said, "Hey, here's a weight loss pill; it's effective." Um, and Weight loss wasn't different between groups, so the placebo effect doesn't always happen. But part of the reason why it might not have happened is that the individuals who were in the placebo group tended to lose self-efficacy and have a higher belief in supplements. So they were attributing any progress they made to the supplement. So what this means is that just by buying supplements, especially if you're someone of low self-esteem or low, low self-efficacy, typically are people who are more apt to buy supplements because they're not at the, the point in behavior change where they have the uh, the mental state to be like, yes, I believe I can be empowered and, and change myself. I'm not looking at supplement ads, which are kind of like a shortcut away from lifestyle change, right? Like, oh, I really should change. I really should change. I don't believe I can. Oh, I can get my results in six weeks. Sweet. Let's go to GNC, you know. Um, the it, Just taking supplements in certain people might hamper their long-term ability to make progress. Which is crazy, regardless of whether the supplements of placebo are real, mm -hmm. because you're starting to put faith in the wrong thing. And I've always found that really, really interesting. A strange part of the unique culture we have in bodybuilding is that bodybuilders tend to have a ton of self efficacy. They tend to be like, it's all about. Narcissistically so. <laughs> yeah, it's all about like outwork, right? Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing about narcissism is it's actually all piled on top of, uh, you know, this, this, this hidden from myself, must protect at all costs, uh, fear that I, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. So bodybuilders tend to have this mentality of, of, I've earned everything I've got. It's all about hard work. You've got to kill yourself and crush yourself. And supplements are great, and I take 45,000 of them, you know? <laughs> and it's because the, the entire bodybuilding industry is propped up by supplement company money. You know, like, yeah. how do you make money as a high-level IPB pro? Well, unless you're winning every damn show, you have a supplement sponsorship. You know, same thing as, you know, every all the way up from IFB pros to physique, uh, you know, models, you know, like supplement money, expos, it's just flooded. 
So the exposure to the supplement industry and the bodybuilding industry, they're almost one and the same. So it's really interesting to me, and I would love to do some more uh, like psychological research on figuring out h- how do those two things affect each other. Being like, you know, I'm all about um, rugged individualism through exercise and, and hard work and masochism drives my success. But you got to take these supplements. They're just as important as training and nutrition. You know, I, yeah. I find that so strange and so interesting. There's probably some some aspect of perfectionism that this allows. I, I'm just guessing. I'm just just I'm not obviously a psychologist, but there's probably some individuals who have a perspective like it's all about me, like that rugged individualism, and then others that are if you could if you come up with a sort of a perfectionism subscale are thinking. I have to do everything possible. I must dot every die and I and cross every T. Yes. And they will take and they're the, Yes, yeah. they have to do all, do everything. The other ones basically are like, no, I want to make this all me. And and it's two forms of extremism, really. There will be some, you'll see this online. It's like it's like I don't take anything but whey protein and creatine and like because nothing yep. else works or what have you. So different yeah, ends I, of the sides of the same coin. And I think that that might mediate differences between when someone chooses to go the natural route or the enhanced route perhaps, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe I don't know, because I think there's a right. lot, there's probably more similarities than there are differences, but anyway. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, I would love to find out more about what causes the placebo, because I, I feel like I've never gotten a placebo effect. If anything, I get like a nocebo, and just, I feel like nothing works. <laughs> Things that I expect to work, it just, I don't know, it just doesn't happen, and Scott, I told you this story before, but um, Eric, I gave my brother, like, this is when he, like, first got into lifting, and he just kind of took everything I said as gospel, So I gave him beta alanine because it's like, okay, you're actually going to feel it. And I told him, I didn't tell him it was like steroid. I said it was like, have like steroid like effects and it's going to do like this amazing results and everything. And he had been training for like a year at this point. So he did like 185 for 10 on bench the last time. And so he takes the beta alanine. He's feeling it. He's like, man, like I really feel this stuff. And we go into the basement. We put 185 on. And like he pushed as hard as he could. And he still only got 10. Like there was no improvement. And I know some of those placebo studies do show an immediate improvement. So I don't know if it's a genetic factor or what, um, but there seems to be a huge variance in the placebo effect. There is. And I think the, uh, it narrows when you're working with more trained and motivated individuals. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like, for example, to go back to that Paralympic weightlifter study. So these are, you know, people who are competing in the Paralympics. They're really, really dedicated athletes. Um, they improved their 50% uh, speed at, at, at 1RM. And then after that, they did three reps at 60, three reps at 70, three reps at 80. So they're, they're, just, they're just basically doing a power workout. Three at 50, 60, 70, and 80% of 1RM on like a bench throw, right? But you now it was non-significant, but the velocity in the placebo groups actually started to go down by the time they got to 70 and 80. So it wasn't a significant difference, and it's a small group study, so I'm not going to claim anything. But what I think happened is just that you can go faster on 50% of 1RM. And your pacing is going to get messed up. You're like, oh, I'm on caffeine. Like, I, I can throw this shit, you know. <laughs> and then they got a little fatigued. And by the time they got to 70 and 80, they didn't have as much left. Mm, right. But when you're talking about a, uh, like a weight loss study or in the general population or people who are exercising because they feel like they're supposed to or they have to to be healthy or to change something about themselves they don't like, not, man, I can't wait to go down to the basement and bench because, A, I love it. And B, like you have a bench press in your basement. I guarantee you the average person doesn't, right? That tells you something about the psychology already going into it. Right. Um, you're already trying as hard as you know that you can be. Mm-hmm. So I think the placebo effect is going to be a much more present when there is reserve on someone's motivation that's so obvious. Um, that said, there are, of course, those steroid studies and everything. So I think right, expectancy right. does tie into how, what's your relationship with training and nutrition already? Uh, you know, compared to what, what you can milk out of someone who's perhaps already resting on their laurels, but now believe that there's some enhancing performance when it's really them. Right, right. There's actually a, um, a caffeine study with, with trained cyclists. I don't know how well trained they are, I can't recall, but they actually showed a graded placebo effects when they were told that they got, I think it was maybe three, six, and nine milligrams per kilogram, something like that, oh, in wow. terms of performance that they, that they saw. It's so funny cool. with... Yeah, it's amazing, right? Um, but yeah, if you have someone who's got poor self-esteem, I can absolutely imagine that if they take the pill and they don't see that the effect happens there, that just validates the fact that the world is against them and nothing works for them, and like you know, this negative aspect or view that view that they have just 
gets gets basically um, substantiated in their mind. Mm -hmm. I wonder, David, with your brother too, if he had been blinded to the weight on the bar because he knew what that was. He knew right. what he could do already. There was no blinding. So you you take some people, uh, and I wonder. And this is what I don't know. I didn't. This is not in the paper. I've looked. Maybe I missed it, but in the Massachusetts paper, for instance, um, some of those athletes didn't get the D-ball placebo, whereas some of them did. I wonder what the culture was like in that gym. Because the, the people who got the D-ball, they, they got, I mean, talk, we know like winning or losing can amplify testosterone levels, for instance, acutely. They won the D-ball. They, they actually earned the right to get that. And they were probably training in the same gym with the other athletes. And, and now they basically have moved to the alpha ranking in the, in the, the tribe is split. Now mm. you've got the winners who get the D ball and the others who don't. Um, they're not training by themselves. This is, these were group athletics. So you've got a situation where like they're, they're expected by everyone around them to, to be better, not just themselves, but the other athletes. And so, right. so you've got a, you've got a collective consciousness there which is which is very unique they're going to keep doing that so there's there's so many aspects to this that are difficult to control experimentally i would think that's especially good. that's a really good point too yeah yeah that's a really good so. point so i had probably twice as many uh questions left but i want to be respectful of your time and uh it's been really good you know the back and forth here so hopefully we can get you guys on for a, a second part here um but before we sign off do we even just say where we can find more of your stuff Scott, I know Fortitude Training on Instagram and where else can people find you? FortitudeTraining.net. Uh, all, all my URLs go to the same place. So my new book, Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach, is the one I'm plugging. All right. Nice. So that, yeah, so people can do their own thing as much as possible and, and free themselves from the chains of, of poor coaches and <laughs> expand their sense of self-efficacy in coaching themselves. There you go. And, of course, I'll have links for everything um, in the description. And, Eric, how about you? Yeah, so it, uh, same kind of thing. All, all of my stuff goes to 3dmusclejourney.com. You can see the picture in the video yeah. of those who are watching. But uh, yeah, that's the uh, the number three, the letter D, musclejourney.com. And you can find all of our content for uh, strength, sport, and bodybuilding from our vault courses to our podcast to our uh, blog articles uh, to links to, to mass if you want to get nerdy or my books. Um, and then if you want more daily content, you can find me at Helms3DMJ on Instagram. And if you're keen for general, cultural, historical, scientific stuff in podcast format, you can check us out. Myself and Omar Isuf, we just started Iron Culture oh, yeah. Podcast. So cool. that, that's pretty much everything I got going on. Cool, man. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.